Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jenny Horn, and I am the manager of the Pennsylvania Action Coalition. I'll be moderating this presentation. Before we begin, I just would like to share a few announcements. All participants are going to be muted during the presentation. If you are experiencing dragging speech, this could be due to your internet connection. Please close any online programs to help fix this problem. If you're having any difficulty during the webinar, feel free to use the chat box on the control panel to communicate with us. We encourage you to ask questions or make comments by, top, by typing into the question box, and this is separate from the chat box. So uh, feel free to use this, this feature throughout the webinar. I uh, wanted to let you all know that we are going to be recording this webinar, and so the link to the video is going to be circulated after the presentation and we will post it on the Pennsylvania Action Coalition as well as the National Nurse, Nurse Like Care Consortium site. So now I'd just like to go over a few notes about continuing education credits. There is no potential conflict of interest or financial interest by the faculty and or planners of this activity to be disclosed. Additionally, there is no endorsement by the National Nurse Like Care Consortium the Pennsylvania Action Coalition, the Bradbury Sullivan LGBT Community Center, the University of Pittsburgh, or ANCC of any commercial products discussed or displayed in conjunction with this educational activity. In order to receive the full contact hour credit for this activity, you must be registered, attend the entire webinar, and complete the online evaluation. Shortly after the webinar's conclusion, we will be sending a short survey to complete along with the link to the recording Please complete this as soon as possible and feel free to reach out to us if you do not receive it. Now, I am thrilled to welcome you to this webinar on behalf of the Pennsylvania Action Coalition and the National Nurse Like Care Consortium. This is the first webinar in our new series that was produced in partnership with the Bradbury Sullivan LGBT Community Center entitled LGBTQIA Plus Health Resources Featuring Nas National Leading Experts. This series will consist of four live webinars throughout the fall. Our first today is part one, informing nursing practice to deliver effective healthcare to sexual and gender minority populations. We are excited to welcome Dr. Perry Halkidis, Dean and Professor of Biostatistics and Urban Global Public Health at the Rutgers School of Public Health the Center, and the Center for Health Identity, Behavior and Prevention Studies. We are thrilled to welcome Dr. Halkidis today to share his insight with us. Our second webinar is part two, providing affirming nursing care for black LGBTQ community members that will be held on October 14, 2020 at 3 p.m. and will be presented by Dr. Jonathan Lassiter, who is the Assistant Professor of Psychology at Rowan University. Registration has been posted on our site. Please check it out and we hope to see you um, October 14th as well. So now I am pleased to introduce Adrian Schenker, who's the Executive Director of the Bradbury Sullivan LGBT Community Center in Allentown, Pennsylvania. We have been so fortunate to collaborate with Adrian on a number of initiatives with the Pennsylvania Action Coalition and thank him for his continued support. So now I'm going to pass the presentation over to Adrian. Thank you, Jenny, and to the entire team at Pennsylvania Action Coalition and National Nurse Led Care Consortium. This is a wonderful opportunity for nurses across Pennsylvania to uh, build on their knowledge um, of LGBTQ health challenges and to do what most nurses want to do all the time, which is to provide high quality affirming care to the LGBTQ patient population and to all of your patients. Um, Bradbury Sullivan LGBT Community Center uh, provides arts, health, youth, and pride programs and is located in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Most of our services are focused on our local community in Eastern Pennsylvania. However, we also um, provide programs around health equity uh, where that include trainings like this one and also, um, also health policy and advocacy work that goes around Pennsylvania. So we're so thrilled for this partnership with National Nurse Led Care Consortium and Pennsylvania Action Coalition to make this series possible. The rest of the series um, will each address, each of the webinars will address uh, slightly different themes uh, on the same topic of LGBTQ inclusive patient care for nurses. Um, so today we'll start with Dr. Halkidis. Uh, Dr. Perry Halkidis is a legendary researcher and scholar and activist who for many years has been uh, really paving a new path in terms of understanding how LGBTQ people experience healthcare in this country. Um, he's author of many, many papers and books, 
most recently out in time, uh, which was just released uh, just in 2019. Uh, so with, with that, uh, please welcome Dr. Perry Halkidis. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, thank you for the legendary adjective. I, I appreciate that. I'll take it. I'm very happy to be here with all of you. Uh, nursing is very near and dear to my heart. Um, as I was concluding my doctoral studies, I was I was working at the National League for Nursing as a psychometrician, and so got to see nursing practice and nursing education up close. So it's my honor to be here with all of you today. Um, so let me see if I can get my slides moving. Okay, so um, I'm going to try to accomplish a lot today. I think it's really important when we have these conversations to first of all start with some groundwork of how we define terms, which I'll do, I'll do first. Then I'll summarize some of the health disparities faced by the population, some of the health challenges, and then try to conclude by applying strategies for working with the population. The, health, the term health disparities is going to come up a lot today. And the notion is really rooted in this idea that in the populations, some populations, often marginalized populations, including sexual and gender minority populations, experience health problems at higher rates than the general population. And case in point, I'm gonna to reveal to you some data from my very recently completed survey of COVID-19 in about 1,100 um, LGBTQ Americans across the country. In the United States, about 2% of the population has had COVID-19. But when we asked, surveyed our LGBTQ people in our study, what we found was that close to 9% of them had tested positive and approximately 11% of them had tested positive for antibodies. So what does that say to me? That says to me, like every other health condition I'm gonna talk about today, LGBTQ people um, often experience health disparities at much higher rates than the general population. So in terms of concepts, so the term LGBT, LGBT or LGBTQ, as many of you know, refers to lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender with Q, Q as queer, queer questioning. This is a non-monolithic group. So many times I'm asked to write papers about the health of LGBTQ people, and, I'm, and my response always is, but I could write six papers because the health of lesbians is not the same as the health of gay men, is not the same as the health of, uh, of bisexual people and what have you. And so what I wanna hope to convey today is that while I'm gonna provide some oversight on general themes that emerge within the population, that the population is not monolithic, right? And we have to debunk this idea that all LGBTQ people are the same. There are distinct pops of populations with specific health challenges, and more importantly, that, that individuals within the population hold many intersectional identities, including race, ethnicity, culture, age, nation of birth, and what have you, which interact with their sexual and gender identity to affect their health. So how many LGBTQ people are there in the country? You know, we, we could know if we put it on the census, but we didn't put it on the sentence. sentence. But the most recent estimate has the population at about 11 million individuals in the United States, which is a number that has grown consistently over the last few years. And part of this growth has been attributed to more millennials, members of the millennial generation, identifying in this manner than in previous generations. The concept of intersectionality is also really key here, and I thank Adrian out for a shout out for my, for, for my book, which is shown here. But intersectionality is a, a concept that psychologists have owned for a very long time and very central to the work that I, that I do, that it is impossible for us to think about sexual identity as separate from race, ethnicity, and culture and class, and the multiple aspects of being including uh, sexual and gender identity that a person possesses, right? And so while I am a gay man and identify as a first generation, I also identify as a first generation scholar, as a man of Greek ancestry, as a, as a guy who was raised in Queens, New York, as a, as, a, as a resident of Newark, as an academic, and as an uncle, as a husband, and all of these identities interact to define who I am. And so for healthcare to really be effective, we must address the whole person and addressing the whole person necessitates that we think about the concept of intersectionality and the identity that people hold. So here's another example. People, when I bring up, when I've been doing HIV work for some 25 years now, people say, well, the LGBTQ population is really affected by HIV. And my answer to them is, 
gay men are affected by HIV and particularly black gay men are affected by HIV and Hispanic gay men. And so I want to push us today to start thinking in a more nuanced way about the health of the population. Sexual behavior and sexual orientation are not the same thing. We know that for a very long time, due to the efforts of the CDC, the term MSM, men who have sex with men, and WSW, women have sex with women, have been used to define the transmission of diseases, including HIV. These are epidemiological terms that I dismiss because they really fail to understand the role that sexual identity plays in shaping health. And while there are certainly MSM, who I do not identify as gay or bisexual, the majority of MSM identify as gay or bisexual. And as a result of that, it is critically important that we continue to advance our treatment of the population with sexual identity and gender identity at the core. And just to further elaborate this point, um, the term sexual orientation is often used synonymously uh, with sexual identity. And the notion consists of at least three aspects one's identity, one's attraction, and one's behavior. One's behavior in and of itself does not necessarily define one's identity. As many of you know, there are many women or men or others who have sex with the same sex partners, but do not identify as gay or bisexual. Sex, sex and gender identity is another concept that we should, should so begin to, to grapple with. One sex is a binary label, often defined as male or female, usually assigned by a doctor at birth on the genitals that somebody is born with. Gender identity is a, a, is a different concept and refers to one self-concept as male or female or a blend of both or either, and how individuals perceive themselves and what they call, call themselves. And importantly, one's gender identity can be the same or different than the sex that they're assigned at birth. The construct of gender identity is complex and multifaceted. Um, gender expression is a term that is used to, uh, uh, to define a person's external experience of one's gender identity. Transgender, an umbrella term for people whose gender identity or expression is different from cultural expectations. And gender transition is a term that is used by some people to, who try to strive to more closely align their internal knowledge of gender with their outward appearance. Again, you'll have these slides, so these terms will all be available to you. A critical part of identity formation for LGBTQ people is their coming out or their identity disclosure. And there is no lockstep pattern for how this happens. One can come out at any age reg regarding their sexual orientation or their gender identity. Coming out, as you all know, requires familial and community support. And quite frankly, as I learned in my book, in, you know, and I hadn't thought about it this way before, but LGBTQ people often spend their lives coming out. Um, and it was interesting to me after 19 years of being at NYU as a scholar, when I came over to Rutgers about four years ago, about three and a half years ago, that all of a sudden I found myself in my mid fifties trying to, again, come out to individuals who had never met me before. And I was, I recalled how challenging it was, was when I was 20 years old, how much easier it was when I was in my mid fifties. But again, this notion that we constantly need to come out is a reality that LGBTQ people live with. Straight people, and we love straight people, right, don't have to live that reality. So think about living with this burden every day of your life. The term queer is one that you have also have heard, is an umbrella term encompassing a lot of people. Um, queer is a term that has been used uh, uh, significantly by younger LGBTQ people, not specific to sexual orientation or gender, but more all embracing with the notion that individuals' gender and sexual identity and culture all interact to define who a person is as a queer person. Okay. My work over the last 25 years has been rooted in this notion of a biopsychosocial perspective. I believe that in order to understand the health of people and populations, it is not enough to think about viruses and bacteria and fungi, but you must think about the biological, the psychological, and the social and structural factors that drive disease. And this is not my original idea. This is an idea that was developed by a, a medical doctor, uh, George Engel in 1977, but I have used it to try to understand how health disparities manifest in the population. 
And for a long time, for many years, I've been saying, well, yes, HIV is a virally produced disease, but it is also a socially produced disease. Because if it was merely a virally produced disease, everybody would have an equal chance of getting it. But in fact, there are some segments of the population that are at much greater risk than others. And it's because of social conditions that those segments of the population are more likely to acquire HIV. The other theory that's a, that's a, that I've applied to my work for the last 25 years is this notion of a syndemic. And this notion of a syndemic basically argues that where you see one health problem, you tend to see one health, other health problems. Where you see mental health burden, you see substance use. Where you see substance use, you may see HIV and other STIs, and you may see violence. And that these health problems interact with each other, they fuel each other, and social conditions, uh, policies, laws, structures, fuel these health disparities and the syndemic that we see in the population. Um, the seminal work that first brought a lot of attention to, to, to uh, academia around the health of the LGBT population was this, based on this report that was published in 2011 by the Institute of Medicine um, that really outlines very clearly the need for continued research and continued activism and continued need to educate in, um, healthcare pr practitioners around issues of LGBTQ health. This report is available for free online in a PDF format. I want to also say that the last few years have been challenging for the LGBTQ population. As you know, there have been several um, attempts to undermine the health of the population, uh, including rules uh, and allowing healthcare providers to refuse care based on religious beliefs and what have you. And all of these do nothing more then try to undermine and prevent adequate care to people based on who they are. And the LGBTQ population is one population that is particularly vulnerable to such issues. Okay, so let me now turn my attention to some of the health disparities we face in the population. Right here are three boxes that show gay men, bisexual individuals, and lesbian health. And what you see is that in each of those areas, there are certain health conditions that manifest much more highly. And they are specific to each of the subpopulations. Um, mental health issues is something that is extremely common across all populations. But when we think about the individual populations, there are nuanced understandings that are required for us as healthcare providers to be able to target care appropriately. In this chart here, we also see that while lesbian, gay, and bisexual men and women do experience poor self-rated health, you know, more chronic diseases, more acute physical symptoms, a uh, younger age at the onset of disability, when we separate out gay and bi men from lesbian and bi women, there are specific differences that emerge. For example, in lesbian bi women, hepatitis C and B is an issue that is of higher prevalence. In gay and bisexual men, as we know, HIV is. Um, and so, so again, trying to reemphasize this idea that LGBTQ healthcare delivery is delivery to L, G, B, T, and Q, and one size does not fit all. Transgender health challenges all also present a, a different set of complexities due to the horm hormone therapy that uh, affects blood pressure and blood sugar and clotting, cancers that may be associated with biological gender, complications from injectable sil silicone, substance use in alcohol, uh, alcohol and tobacco and other drug use, depression and anxiety, and STIs and cardiovascular disease. The number there under the STIs basically shows an estimate from a recent publication that showed uh, a prevalence rate of 14.1% of HIV in transgender women and 3.2% in and transgender men. And these numbers much higher than the general population. Mental health disparities is, an, is a matter that has been addressed consistently over the course of the last 40 years with regard to the health of population. What you see here in the blue are LGB people and in the burnt red, heterosexual people. And you can see pretty consistently across the board from this paper that was published by my, my buddy, Mark Hudson Bueller, that LGB people experience any psychotic disorder, mood disorders, anxiety disorders, and substance use disorders at higher rates than heterosexuals. And so 
the simple knee-jerk reaction say, well, oh, well, you know, behaviorally, LGB people, they're just irresponsible, they use drugs. And the fact of the matter is that that is the, the, the most absurd false notion that there could possibly be. The fact of the matter is that LGB people experience mental health disparity, disparities and substance use disorders because of the social conditions in which they're growing up. And so living, being, this goes back to this idea of a endemic, living in a society that creates structural inequalities, that perpetuates discrimination, is likely to lead to mental health burden and risk behaviors in terms of substance use. We see this consistently in lesbian and, and gay men, uh, higher rates of depression, anxiety disorder, psychological dip, dis, distress for gay men, also body image and eating disorders, which is an area that is emerging as one that is, needs to be further studied and for, um, and for lesbian and bisexual women, antidepressant use. This is a, uh, findings from uh, SAMHSA that were published in 2016. Um, and again, sexual minority, this in, in this case in brown, I guess, sexual majority, heterosexual in tan. And what you see here is percent using drugs. This is illicit drugs in the last year. And pretty consistently across age levels and across gender, sexual minority individuals are reporting substance use at higher rates. Uh, this is also pe people reporting mental illness, and again, consistently across the board in terms of age and in terms of gender, uh, sexual minority individuals reporting at much higher rates. Again, reflecting back to this idea that substance use doesn't happen separate from mental health, doesn't happen separate from HIV, doesn't happen separate from policies and laws, doesn't happen separate from discrimination. All of these things fuel together. They create an incubator that undermines the health of the population. Transgender folks also experience these high rates of, of, of mental health issues with some 62%. This is a paper that was published by Fenway, an amazing institute up in Boston. 62% of transgender individuals reporting depression, 41 attempted suicide, 30% smoking daily, and 26% alcohol and drug use. LGB, LGB youth, Health concerns include, as I've said previously, smoking and ho homelessness, suicide attempts, and the risk of being bullied, threatened, and sexually coerced. And the source of this is often the vulnerability for LGB youth is often rooted in their families and in the, um, and, and in the, and the rejection. So parental rejection, as Caitlin Ryan, a very leading researcher in the field, has shown us, is that when parents reject their children because of their sexual identity, this is associated with higher attempts, suicide attempts, more drug use, higher rates of depression, more unprotected sex or condomless sex, and higher rates of homelessness and residential instability. All of these things because of the social conditions of the family. And I will say, because I think it's too simple to say that one, one leaves one's family and enters the gay community or the gay population, that things automatically get better. I would actually argue that for many LGBT youth, the transition from the family to a population of LGBT people is complicated. And often the rules and the structures and the expectations that are placed upon LGBTQ people by their own peers creates another level of, st of stress in the lives of young LGBT people. And we can explore that idea more, but I don't think the LGBT population in and of itself is free from the type of rejection that LGBT people face from their own families. We do it, to, we oft, also often and too often, I fear, do it to ourselves. This is a, an illustration based on Caitlin's work, um, also from the 2009 paper, that shows suicide attempts um, across three groups of, of, of young people, those with low family rejection, moderate family rejection, and high family rejection. And not surprisingly, individuals who are coming out to their families who experience high levels of rejection are almost also more, more likely to have had a suicide attempt. Also here, um, what you see in this illustration in the orange here is gay, lesbian, and bisexual, and the, um, uh, uh, in the yellow is, is heterosexual. What you see on the left is that gay, lesbian, bisexual youth are 5% of the population, 
but they are 40% of the homeless population. So how do you know a health disparity is a health disparity? Well, if there were no differences by sexual orientation and gender identity, then 5% of the people who are in the, in the then only 5% of the homeless youth would be lesbian, gay, or bisexual. But the fact that 40% are shows us that. Another example of this is HIV. In the general population, gay, gay men are, I don't know, anywhere from 3 to 5% of the population, but 60% of the new infections. So again, this weird, weird disparity, this abnormal disparity that is perpetuate that demonstrates the perpetuation of the of the of the health condition in the population reasons for homelessness among lgbt youth often have to deal with running away from home because of familial rejection or because they're being forced out of their home because of their families right so the health of individuals young lgbt individuals is predicated in great to a great extent on the ability of the family to reconcile the relationship between themselves and the child. And I would be remiss not to say that this is hard for both sides. It is not just hard for the young person coming out, it is hard for the parents too. And they have to find, as both have to find a place to negotiate this new relationship. So it would be so overly simplistic of me to say, shame, 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 shame on parents. Um, I want all parents to love their kids, like my parents at 18 years old, my sixth grade educated Greek immigrant parents who just said, we love you when I told them I was gay at 18. I want that to be the reaction of other people, of other families too. I know that increasingly that is happening, but it is still not the norm. And too often it is this rejection, this uh, pushing away that happens that leads to the health problems that we tend to see in the population, including the health problem of homelessness. So this is all to say, coming back to the Institute of Medicine report, that while there are certainly demographic factors that drive the health of the population, ultimately there are structural factors, including structural stigma, lack of knowledge in the part of healthcare, health insurance and other issues that are very big determinants of the health of the LGBTQ population. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about one of my areas of study, which has been fascinating to me, which is HPV. HPV, as you know, uh, comes in multiple forms. There are multiple versions, multiple strains of human papillomavirus. Um, there are at least five or six strains, but particularly six strains, 16 and 18, that cause cancer. Um, this has been documented in women and female identify and female, biologically female individuals as a, a form as a driver of cervical cancer. Increasingly, it is clear that HPV infection also is the root of anal cancer for all people, but especially for gay men. So this was a study that we uh, are still working on, which is a study of HPV vaccination um, in young folks that we undertook starting about 2015. Now I will tell you that vaccination for HPV, this is a study of young emerging adult, male identified gay and bisexual men. Um, HPV vaccination became available on or around 20, 2006, 2007, 2008. What you see in this first slide is despite the fact that the, the availability was there, less than half of these young men as they, as they came of age were vaccinated for HPV, which is really, really criminal. And why are they not vaccinated? Well, one, they believed financial, the cost was, the cost was prohibitive, um, but you know, the, they were told that, they, that the insurance would not pay for it. Two, because um, they had medical mistrust um, of the vaccination. I think it's a phenomenon we're seeing in our society a lot right now. But one of the most common reasons was this gendered misinformation that the vaccine was only for girls. So one, the quote from this one participant was it, the vaccine, was really just marketed to young girls, like protect your doors from cervical cancer, get the HPV vaccine. More recently, the CDC and other entities have begun to market and to educate about the vaccination of boys, but we have a whole generation that has, has a missed opportunity. I will just remind everyone that now the federal government and insurance will cover vaccination up to age 45. And even if one is 
vaccine, even when it's, when it's exposed to HPV, there are some evidence that the vaccination may slow down the onset of cancer causing cancer due to cancer causing strains. Um, when we looked at what the drivers of infection was, and by the way, we tested, um, um, uh, we tested, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm reading the side here. I'm getting engaged in the conversation on the side here, but I'm coming back. When we tested presence of HPV infix, infection orally and anally in these individuals by using swabs and a rinse, and what we found uh, pretty consistently, it was that HPV infection was highly related to HIV infection. And that this is a complication for the population because HIV positive people, while HPV can be cleared, it is much more challenging for HIV positive people to clear HIV. Okay. I'm now gonna turn my attention to challenges faced by the LGBT population with healthcare and their experience with healthcare. And this is just a tweet um, from some point last year from the Human Rights Campaign indicating that high rates of discrimination for LGB patients and trans patients from healthcare providers. In fact, this, these charts published by Lambda Legal in 2010 show the experience of health professionals refusing to touch their, their, their individuals because they're LGB or transgender or living with HIV or blamed for their health status or using harsh or abusive language or being physically rough or abusive. These, these should all be zero, but in fact, they're not. And one of the reasons, uh, many of, some of the reasons why um, um, LGBT people experience health disparities and transgender, L, transgender people and people living with HIV experience these problems is because they fear they will be refused medical care because of the way they're being treated, because they can't find access to uh, health professionals that adequately understand their problems, because they have not enough support. So all of these conditions, including fear of the healthcare uh, profession is something that plays up. I have a paper coming out in the American Psychologist any moment now about the role that public health psychology has to fuse the, what I see as the chasm between public health and clinical care. And one of the things I think nurses really do well, and I know psychologists really do well, is to acknowledge people's fears and concerns. And I think too often the medical question casts those aside, like, why don't you take your pills every day? Well, why? There's a million reasons why. Or why don't you take a vaccine? And I think nursing and psychology and social work and other helping professions are much better equipped at handling this thing. And I think unless we continue to grapple with people's fears and mistrust, we're going to continue to lose people to the, in the healthcare system. And we're going to lose people to disease that we shouldn't be losing people to. I'm going to pass this slide because it's too much. This is um, findings from one of our own studies. Um, that show, this is a study of um, gay men in uh, New York City. Um, and what you can see and on the left side um, um, is gay men on the right side are, are women, lesbian women. And you can see here that some 20% of the gay men in, in, the, in that sample had, and some 27% of the females on the, other, on the right hand side of the screen had foregone healthcare in the last year probably for one of the many reasons I've, I've, I've shared with you earlier. So I also want to sort of bring some um, language to the, to the issue and sort of um, provide you with some quotes from um, the people who we've interviewed around healthcare. This is uh, from a 22-year-old Hispanic man who said, the doctor wasn't knowledgeable with the LGBT community. She's never really had gay patients. So for her, it's kind of new. And her reaction was kind of like, you're young right now. You shouldn't be having anal sex. It wasn't the reaction I was expecting. And here is a quote of a young black man, 24-year-old, who said, he, the doctor, a Muslim. So his thing is, he doesn't want to hear too much about sex with guys on guys. So it really makes it uncomfortable for me to talk about it because all I'm going to get is, quote, marry a girl. It just comes up all the time because he knows I'm gay. And this quote about the communication discomfort is from a 23-year-old black man who said, I've always gotten knowledge of gay men health and about risk and HIV and stuff through outside sources. I feel uncomfortable speaking to my doctor. So, and this one, 
I actually got an anal pap smear. The guy who runs the service organization was just telling some of the guys in this gays men's group about the service they offered. And I realized that I don't think my doctor offers that from a 24 year old Hispanic male. So lots of illustrations of miscommunication and fear and anxiety and misinformation and dismissal of one's sexual or gender identity by healthcare providers, which creates obstacles to care. Now, you know, when we think about the experience of LGBT people in healthcare, I ask each of you to ask yourselves this question. When you last saw a clinician for primary care, were you asked to discuss your sexual history or your sexual health? Have you ever been asked about your sexual orientation? Has a clinician ever asked you have concerns about your gender identity? And I really push you to think about those things because I suspect many of you have not been asked those questions. A survey in 1982, which seems like a lifetime ago, found that 39% of individuals of California physicians were uncomfortable or often, sometimes are often uncomfortable providing care to their gay patients. In 1999, while somewhat better, some close to 20% were sometimes or often uncomfortable providing care to gay patients. So even that 20 years ago, and I bet if we did this today, we would have similar numbers. And I'll come to that. A study published in 2007 uh, found that 30% of people would change providers if they knew their provider was gay or lesbian. And 35% would change practices if they found that gay and lesbian providers work there. And so again, the discrimination is not just happening to the patients, but the discrimination is happening from patients who are not LGBTQ to potential providers. This also happens in medical school, where in this 2005 survey, people who were, in, who were surveyed indicated that 15% were aware of the mistreatment of LGBT students at their schools, and 17% of LGBT students reported hostile environments in their medical training. Now, this is a very, 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 very recent study uh, about uh, implicit and explicit attitudes. This is from a year and a half ago. Um, and this was a study that found that implicit preferences for heterosexual people versus lesbian and gay people were pervasive among heterosexual care health care providers. This is from 2015, published in the American Journal of Public Health. So there is this implicit reaction, this implicit bias, this deep-seated orientation that makes healthcare providers have preferable attitudes to heterosexual people than to LGBT people. So what do we need to do about this? What do we need to do in order to solve these problems? Think that you cannot solve this problem by tackling things in one way, that we have to think about what, what we need to do in terms of policy, what we need to do to create a welcome, welcoming environment for LGBT patients, to talk about how we use gender neutral patient forms, I'll talk about that, how we do test staff training, and how we take sexual histories. And I think each of these elements will help contribute to changing the culture within clinics and hospitals and other entities uh, around the health of LGBT people. So first and foremost, when I work with organizations that are trying to change the way they do business with the population, um, I talk about the need to develop policies, non-discrimination policies that protects patients, um, developing potentially patient advisory councils to address any issues that could enhance the care of patients, and identifying staff or physicians with expertise who can serve as LGBT champions. So having an LGBT champion within a healthcare and organization, within an organization that also has non-discrimination policies is a really critical step for creating a safe environment for LGBT people to get, receive their care. Creating a welcoming environment means that we create an environment where we have uh, a setting where that is inclusive, where waiting rooms are, you know, are, are, are not just uh, comfortable for people who are straight, but are comfortable for LGBT people. And how do you do that? There are simple things we can do, like providing L uh, relevant brochures on relevant LGBT topics, providing gender neutral intake forms, creating gender neutral bathrooms, right? And creating a culture of humility. This is an example of a form that can be used that, at, that if you had this in your 
in your facility would automatically message to people that being LGBT or being, um, uh, being, being, being LGBTQ matters. So there's a very simple set of questions here that ask an individual what their gender identity is, what their sex was at signed at birth, what pronouns they use. Here's another example here that asks people to identify their sexual orientation, the sex they were assigned at birth, you know, how they identify, not, if they identify as trans. And these, when somebody sees that on an intake form, it creates a sense of ease that they're not going to be rejected and they are going to be more comfortable then in disclosing and discussing health issues knowing that the environment is welcoming. Staff training is a critical component there. And I think that it is incredibly important for us to train our staff to deal with homophobia for sure. The attitudes, the negative attitudes that people have towards LGBT people, but also heterosexism, the knee jerk reaction that everybody is straight, right? And I think that, um, these have to be tackled together because when you just assume heterosexual is what everybody is, you're normalizing heterosexual at the expense of LGBTQ. And my whole push for the health of the population is normalization. So that making, making people, allowing people to come out and disclose their status, uh, HIV or their identity or their gender should be something that is met without huge, horrible reactions. Not over the top reactions, not negative reactions, just like a, re a regular reaction as you would react to a heterosexual person. That is a normalization that I think is absolutely critical if we are to advance the well being of the population. How well do you know your patients? So for example, look at this individual shown in the picture here. Here's a new patient. Here's a new lesbian patient. How would you feel when learning this? I ask you to ask yourself, how would you treat this person differently? Or how would you tailor their care differently? If you knew the person was lesbian, whether versus you didn't know the person was lesbian. I suggest, that you would probably have a much more tailored approach to the delivery of care. Um, it is critical for all of us in our environments, in schools, in our health clinics, in our organizations, to ask ourselves constantly, do staff, people feel comfortable working with the LGBT population? Are there opportunities to discuss issues and concerns? Are staff informed on current LGBT health needs? You know, again, this idea of normalization and making a space for people to be able to share their thoughts and ideas without judgment. There are people in your mix who are going to be more knowledgeable. There are people in your mix who are gonna be less knowledgeable. And we have to make it comfortable for all of those folks to interact with each other and to learn from each other to create a healthy and safe environment. Taking sexual histories is part of the normalization process. When we ask people about who they have sex with, right, we get to really understand who they are. And I love this quote from the Institute of Medicine from some 20 years ago that says, ironically, it may require a greater intimacy to discuss sex than to engage in it. And I think that is completely, completely true. So what's being done nowadays to document healthcare delivery that's competent for LGBTQ people. So this report by the Human Rights Campaign is the Health Equality Index. And it is a report that's been published, I think now for four years, where there is a summary and a rating of um, organizations, healthcare organization throughout the country with regard to healthcare delivery to LGBT people. And it is based on this metric of 100 points going from patient discrimination, including patient discrimination, equal, equal visitation, a variety of different factors that are used to create a total score. 
In the last report, there were 25 such entities um, in the state of Pennsylvania that were included in the report. Um, and here is just a snapshot. Right there is the link where you can see the, um, the scores for the 25 entities in Pennsylvania. But you can see, I just took a snapshot along the side there of three of the entities. And then when you click on that entity, it actually goes to the, to the breakdown of the score. For example, Abington Hospital, which scores quite low at the score of 65. So this is, and uh, this survey is one that individual, individual organizations self-select into and is one that I encourage all organizations to take part of, even if the scores are not perfect, because it is a way of being accountable to the health of the population. Finally, let me just finally conclude by saying this, you know, enhancing LGBT healthcare to me is just about enhancing human rights. And so when we think about the rights of people in our country, when we think about the rights of all of our citizens, if when we champion the rights of people, we're ultimately going to improve their care. There are, enormous, there, there, there are numerous resources available to us for uh, addressing the health of the population. These reports, these guides published by the Fenway Institute, other sources from the medical, American Medical Association and GLAM, again, here with the links here for you, other LGBT sources from, from GLAD, also available to you. I, I'm very proud to say that a few couple of years ago, when we were first thinking about LGBTQ health issues at our own school, there was an attempt, there was a discussion about creating a certificate in LGBTQ public health. And my faculty were amazing. And they came back to me and said, no, we don't need an LGBTQ certificate. We need an LGBTQ concentration. And so we have the world's first MPH concentration in LGBTQ health that has a bunch of students in it right now. Um, and it is really, uh, really a deep dive into public health concepts, but public health concepts as they relate to the LGBTQ population. The journal that, that was also listed earlier that Jennifer shared with all of you about a year ago or two years ago, my colleague and I were sitting around sort of complaining about the fact that there wasn't a journal out there that dealt with public health issues for LGBTQ populations. So if it doesn't, if it's not there, you gotta do it, right? And so we did. And this journal has launched as of last year and it has been huge. The response has been absolutely huge. I will say that the journal is open access for the first two years. We have published two issues so far. We are about to publish our third issue. Our fourth issue at the end of the year is gonna be on, has papers all about COVID-19 and the LGBT population. I encourage you to go look at it, get hands on those articles. There's some really, really great pieces that are appearing in this, in this journal. Finally, you, know, you can follow me at those Twitter sites or at my link here that has many of my articles and my video presentations. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Halkidis. And uh, we have some questions that I'll, that I'll post to you, but I just want to quickly remind everyone that if you have questions that you haven't asked, you can um, add them in the Q&A section on the bottom of your Zoom screen, and I will try to get to your questions. And I also want to just quickly remind everyone that this is the first in a four-part series. Uh, we hope that you'll join us again next month when uh, Dr. Jonathan Lasseter speaks about Black LGBTQ health in the United States. The month after that, it will be uh, Ryan Thorson, an attorney um, uh, and researcher at Human Rights Watch and Yale Law School. We'll be talking about human rights and health for LGBTQ youth. And in December, we'll be back with the healthcare consumer panel um, talking about the health of LGBTQ women. Um, so we have a really great series. Um, and first, a couple um, accolades, um, congratulating you, Dr. Halkidis, on the journal and suggesting this was a fabulous presentation. Some of the questions that have come in, um, first, if you could define the difference between low, moderate, and high levels of family rejection. Yeah. Uh, so first, I will say that uh, I would encourage you all to go read the Caitlin Ryan paper. It's in from 2009. It is, it is available for free access. But essentially, what, what Caitlin argues, very violent, pushing out of the house is high, right? High levels of rejection. And then low is more disappointment and less violent rejection. The rejection is still there, but it is not the violent 
pushing out of the house. It is more the disappointment. So let me, let me play it out for you. Uh, a high level rejection is get out of the house, you pervert, right? You know, because I'm sure that's been said. The low level rejection is something like, oh, I'm sad to hear this. Um, are you sure you're gay? Right? While, like, while not horrific, still not great. The best response is, I love you. I've said this, I said this earlier in my talk. That's, that's the right, that's, that is the best answer. Uh, thank you. Um, the next question is from uh, Dr. Fortuna, who asks, um, for minors in the exam rooms, can you clarify about your suggestion to talk to adolescent patients without parents present when taking a sexual history? Can I comment on that about yes. what it, whether is the question whether it should be done or how it should be done? Uh, yeah, should family members be asked to step out of the room during yeah. the sexual history? Yes, absolutely. So look, I think that in the book, Periarchitis Out in Time 2019, as Adrian uh, so lovely shared with you earlier, um, the coming out, I kind of spent the whole book talking about coming out in all these different ways, right? But I spent a chapter early talking about coming out to parents. The reason I did that is because that is often the most difficult conversation for most, for most LGBT people to have. We test out the waters with our brothers and our sisters and our friends and what have you, and then eventually we get to our parents. For that reason, I would strongly encourage that conversations about sexuality and sexual behavior happen separate from the parents with the child, that, with adolescent uh, themselves, with the parent not in the room. You will get to more truth that way. There's a question about if you've seen any improvements in healthcare visits or healthcare experiences for an LGBTQ patient population uh, since 2010, so in the last decade. Yeah. No, two steps forward, one step back, right? So this is the reality, I think, for, for, for many of us. Look, I think that actually, the paper I shared from 2015 shows that there's still problems. Certainly, look, prior to the AIDS epidemic, there was no attention to LGBT health. And then the AIDS epidemic happens and whether, you know, despite all the disgusting, horrible death that we all had, well, I had to live through it and many of you probably witnessed, it did bring attention to the health of the population. And suddenly healthcare providers had to pay attention to the health of the population. And so that was a move in the right direction, albeit at a cost. The last 20 years have been a slow, incremental step. Unfortunately, the last several years have been a few steps back. Because I think once you allow people to use religious freedom as an excuse not to treat their patients, then immediately you create unfriendly environments. So I think that we're at a standstill right now in terms of the improvement of health of the population we see it with HIV. There is no reason for there to be 40,000 new infections a year in this country. There really isn't, right? We've, we've, got, we've got the tools. We've got PrEP. We've got undetected liquids untransmittable. The idea if somebody's positive and they're on their meds, they can't transmit the HIV. But the fact is that we have some 40,000 new infections. And this is because social conditions fuel this disease. And social conditions are often perpetuated by healthcare industry and political situations that are not favorable to LGBTQ people. I want to ask you about COVID because COVID is on the minds of every healthcare professional uh, in the country, certainly in Pennsylvania. Um, uh, and I'm wondering if you can speak to how nurses uh, might, um, might pay extra uh, attention or provide extra um, care for the LGBTQ patient population to ensure that patients feel comfortable receiving uh, you know, COVID testing, COVID treatment, um, or other services that aren't COVID related, but during this time when, uh, when high quality care is just so extra important? Yeah, I mean, I think it's about asking the right questions, right? And so I, I mentioned during the course of my talk, creating a welcoming environment and asking questions about COVID. I mean, asking questions about sexuality and uh, sexual identity and, and gender identity. I mean, and I think for all of us, all of us, uh, regardless if somebody's LGBT or non-LGBT, I think delving deep into what people are feeling physiologically is going to be critically important here because I don't think we know. Case in point, March, 29th, March 19th, 2020, perihalkitis 
is in his home in New York City, having left his apartment in Newark. Suddenly, for like three or four days, my body aches and I have a sore throat and I have a headache, right? I couldn't get a COVID test because there weren't enough COVID tests at the time. But I was able to pick up the phone and talk to my doctor who calmed me down and gave me some, some, some directions. I think being available right now, and by the way, I did have it because I have antibodies, right? Um, and quite frankly, thank God I knew about it because I just thought it was a cold. I would have gone to the gym otherwise and spread it wildly there. I think being attentive to anything that just doesn't seem right, like that seems off, is going to be really critically important for LGBT people and for the general population because I don't think you even begin to understand all the manifestations of this disease. By the way, I had the no taste thing for a month. It was wild. So, you know, um, LGBT healthcare is primary care. So for all the nurses and other health professionals that are listening in today, it's important that, you know, one of the reasons that we, we worked with Pennsylvania Action Coalition and National Nurse-Led Care Consortium to put this series together is because LGBT health isn't some boutique specialty. It is, it is all health, you know, dermatology is LGBT health and uh, gynecology is LGBT health and infectious disease treatment is LGBT health and primary care visits are LGBT health. So um, we hope that part of the takeaway from today's presentation is that every healthcare professional provides care for LGBT patients. Um, every healthcare professional, every healthcare clinic and every healthcare um, organization, every hospital provides care for the LGBT patient population. And it's important that, that nurses, especially frontline care professionals, are, um, are informed about the needs of the LGBT patient population. I posted Dr. Halkidis's book uh, out in time, the link to purchase the book in the chat. Uh, and uh, Dr. Halkidis, we thank you so much for joining us today. I'd like to turn this back over to, uh, to Jenny Horn from uh, Pennsylvania Action Coalition to give some final remarks. Awesome, thank you so much, Adrian and Dr. Halkidis for your really informative and excellent presentation. Uh, for any questions that you know, did not have the opportunity, you know, if you didn't have the opportunity to address them or something that you're thinking about, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, my email was provided uh, on the slide below and I'll, I'll send it again in the chat. Uh, but uh, again, we, you know, we, we'd love to hear from you and additionally, we'd love to have you join our networks. You can stay you know, in the loop by visiting our websites and signing up for our listservs and following us on social media. Uh, I'd also like to thank our really wonderful planning team from the Pennsylvania Action Coalition and the National Nurse Like Care Consortium, Aidan Karlheim, Zahara Davud, Justin Giroux, and Sarah Hexham Hubbard. And just thank you again to the Bradbury Sullivan LGBT Community Center for your uh, really wonderful partnership. And if you don't mind going on to the next slide, Aidan. Um, so I just wanted to uh, take the time to, to give a short plug for the Action Coalition's uh, upcoming virtual conference that will be hosted in partnership with the Penn State College of Nursing, uh, be held as a series of webinars from March 1st through 5th with the theme of advocacy and equity in action. And our call for abstracts has been announced. They are due October 11th. Uh, feel free again to reach out um, to us with any questions, but hope to see you virtually at this conference. Uh, and then I would also just like to give a brief shout out to the Action Coalition's podcast series entitled At the Core of Care, which highlights the creative efforts of nurses to advocate for the health of the patients and the communities that they serve. Uh, we actually did feature uh, Adrian Schenker on uh, one of our episodes. And so we'd love it if you could subscribe or uh, take a listen. Uh, you can find them uh, really anywhere that you listen to podcasts. And so just again, stay tuned for, for more opportunities. And we certainly hope to uh, see you again on October 14th at 3 p.m. Uh, again, we'll hear from Dr. Jonathan Lasseter, who is the Assistant Professor of Psychology at Rowan University. Uh, registration is, is on our website. And uh, there will be another two webinars, in November and December, as part of this series as well. So and stay healthy and hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And thanks again to Dr. Hakaitis.